What if you could hang out in an epic location with an awesome, like-minded practitioner tribe, having extraordinary experiences with a community of leaders, innovators, and visionaries, all sharing their wisdom to move our profession forward? It all starts with the Naturpreneur Experience, a professional development conference like no other for naturopaths, nutritionists, herbalists, and practitioners. Check out NatX2019 at TammyGuest.com for more details. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining me again on the line today is Beck Guild, who's a dear friend and colleague. She's been a naturopath for over 14 years and is currently the curator for FX Medicine. She studied naturopathy and Western herbal medicine, graduating in 2003. And she has a great respect for the therapeutic actions of enzymes. And we thought we'd discuss this topic to give you, our listeners, a heads up about these greatly underutilized therapies. Welcome back, Beck. How are you? Good, thank you. Now, Beck, I think we have to go right back to the beginning with enzymes. What exactly is an enzyme? Right, yes. Well, to put it very simply, enzymes are catalysts and they are responsible for turning one thing into another thing. Hmm. So the most common way that they're thought of, of course, is in digestion because it is essential for us to convert our food into all the very many substrates that we use in our body. So most of probably what we'll end up talking about today is the application of it um, through oral therapy and, you know, its impact on food and reactions in the body. And I I think one of the important things about enzymes is that with some reactions in chemistry or biochemistry, um, that enzymes aren't necessary for that reaction to occur but that enzymes help it to happen quickly. And indeed, in this is one of the instances why they're so important for life. Without these enzymes, we just couldn't convert carbon-based atoms into energy fast enough for us to live. So, you know, this is, I, I think this is one of the key things that people need to understand. It's not that things won't necessarily happen. It's just that these happen quickly. So I guess the message is you are not only what you eat, but what you can absorb and utilize. So with these enzymes that we're talking about as a therapy, as an oral therapy, where do we get them from? So let's just um, park the idea of where we get them from from a therapy. Um, I'll go into that in a second, but where do we get them from in general? As in if we didn't intervene with therapy, we would get them obviously from our um, food supply. Right. So the problem with that is that most of us eat so poorly that one of the key areas that we get our enzymes from or the substrates to produce those enzymes in the body is from food. And in particular, fruits and vegetables in their most raw state and often on the skin. More often than not, that's where they're located. Um, Some other examples where we get, you know, really high yield enzyme products are also in fermented foods. So, you know, one of my personal favorites, kombucha yep. or perhaps sauerkraut. Um, just the action of fermentation itself produces this wonderful symbiosis of probiotics and enzymes. And I think that's, you know, part of the reason why we all feel so great when we eat them. Absolutely. And, and an oft forgotten source of the enzymes. We don't even think about it now, do we? We just think about, we, we, we use the term fermentation. We don't think how they were fermented. <laughs> For sure. And is it any wonder that, um, you know, the chronically um, sad standard Australian diet <laughs> that we eat um, results in people being immensely fatigued and tired? Well, it's because they're not eating fresh, vital, and enzyme-rich, therefore, food. Yes. They're not getting these substrates to catalyse, as you said before, at speed, these reactions. There's a little point here, I guess. I remember one practitioner years ago criticised the inclusion, let's say, of cellulase in a proteolytic enzyme formula, saying basically that humans don't produce cellulase. And that is true. 
we're not a ruminant animal like a cow who needs cellulase to release the plant starches. However, we eat plants and plants have cellulases. So this sort of um, notion that just because we don't produce it, we therefore have no use for it as an oral therapy isn't quite true, particularly when we consider the true diet that we should be eating rather than the packaged food, as you say, in the standard Australian diet. What about, <laughs> what about measuring them though? You know, like, um, you know, the standard, we're talking about vitamin B6 and you measure it in milligrams, but enzymes uh-huh. aren't the same, right? No. In fact, there are so many different acronyms for the various measurement units of measurement for your different types of enzymes. So, um, for example, um, lactase is measured by ALU and cellulase will be measured in CU, which is the cellulase unit mm. for digestion of fiber. Um, amylase is, is known as a DU unit for digesting carbs. I think that's called an alpha amylase dextrinizing unit because, you know, put important information there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then protease is probably, proteases are probably the most common, um, you know, application of enzymes in, in a therapeutic way that we apply. Yeah. And they're measured in HUT units. Well, you would never have a clue as to why they're called that, but it's a way, I suppose, to measure the activity or the amount of catalyst that's, that's happening. That yeah, it's, it's yeah. Cat- catalyst potential. I, th- I think the real learning objective, if you like, from this is it gives us a way of saying this is a centimetre, that's a centimetre. We're not talking yeah. about, oh, I've got, a, I've got a cubit, which is an elbow to the wrist, uh, sorry, elbow to f- fingertip. Um, I've got a cubit, you've got a cubit, but my arm's longer than yours, so that cubit's different. And that's the problem yeah. with milligrams in when we're talking about activity. Um, yeah, it's a measure of concentration. Like yeah. If we are talking about bromelain, for example, well, you could have 100 milligrams of bromelain and you could have 200 milligrams of bromelain. And depending on how the that basic um, source material has been grown, treated, Crap concentrated, pineapples. Might, <laughs> yeah, it, might, it might affect the yield of the HUT yeah. unit. Um, that, that that are displayed on a label is Bromo, well, so 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 this is one of the issues I think we have with labeling in Australia about what you're allowed to say on supplements and this is an interesting thing you know people want this practitioners want this this is the truth but you're not allowed to say that because the restrictions in Australia with the therapeutic goods administration disallow that form of measurement. So bromelains, I think, are measured in GDU units, but we're not allowed to say that in Australia on the label. You can say that in America, Mm. which is weird because normally their labelling is far inferior to Australian labelling. Sorry for our listeners who are based in the US. (laughs) But in this instance, the TGA really does have the upper hand. But I I think it's one Mm. area which the TGA needs to move so that we can actually get a, a measure of activity. Um, to be able to allow well, manufacturers to state that on the label. Yeah, I suppose as we as we increasingly become um, one global economy for the use of these kinds of things, some uniformity would be good, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, it'd be nice. But what I think is interesting, <laughs> though, is that like uh, I think it was in 2004, the TGA did a flip, and that is that before that time, you were not allowed plant-based enzymes and you were only allowed animal-based that is pig-based or porcine-based enzymes, um, for oral therapy. However, in 2004, there was a flip because of basically the stability of over-the-counter supplements. And so they then preferred plant-based enzymes, which are stable, uh, over porcine-based, which are not. They have to be refrigerated except for a couple of drug um, uh, examples there. So I think this oh. is just interesting how the, you know, the market moves and what we're allowed um, as to uh, compared to or versus what, um, what works in therapy. Yes. Well, we're always going to have changes too, because I mean, you can have, you can have amazing things available, but they've also got to be made commercially accessible yeah. and also safe. Yeah. So, I mean, um, that's, part of what we hope at least our regulators are keeping their finger on the pulse of is part of that reason is that by 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 making it more freely accessible to access veggie enzymes which don't degrade it you know um as 
as a restricted temperature window and they really widely available through a wide pH in the body that therefore making them quite effective and you know they're not going to break down degrade or anything like that in the capsule before they used or employed them um fit therapeutically then um you know it, it, it all comes down to safety yeah ongoing safety and the commercial availability of product you made two brilliant points there, and the first one is safety, and that is indeed what the TGA is famous for worldwide, um, that the Australian medicines really are well regulated in that respect. The other point you make is the stability of the plant-based enzymes over porcine-based. It's got a much wider pH range, so it's mm. at, they're active whether people are underproducers or indeed overproducers or indeed inappropriate producers of acid. And this, to Absolutely. me, is where plant-based enzymes come in. I totally agree. Mm. That That is by far where and why I think that vegetarian enzymes are a superior choice. Yeah. Because particularly in the field that we're working in, in, in you know, naturopathic medicine, integrative medicine, functional medicine, whichever you're calling it, um, you know, most of the people that are coming to stuff have disrupted digestion. They don't have this wonderful... Um, you know, pH happening with their, their stomach acid and they've usually got a pre-existing digestive disorder whether they know it or not. And so uh, you can't guarantee that that uh, uh, minor window, and I meant to look this up, but uh, there's this, a really minor window. It's, it's like 2.2 to 2.4 or 2.6, something like that is your therapeutic window of pH for um, animal-derived enzymes, whereas a vegetarian enzyme has a really wide pH range. It's something like right down from two and right up to as high as, you know, I think it was 12. eight or nine. Yeah, I thought it was really quite alkaline that it will go through. So Even the proteases, you can break them apart. Like you get neutral proteases and, and it's like, well, it gets really confusing. So you've got to sort of say, well, you can make a broad brushstroke and say two to 12, but some of them are sort of active at the higher end i.e. more alkaline, and some of them are active at the more acid end. It's the shotgun versus yeah. the machine gun approach. You're yeah. probably going to hit more stuff with a machine gun just because just it's rapid fire. <laughs> uh, i, I got to say, and this is where I constantly pigeonhole digestive enzymes for use. I constantly do it, except for a couple of, of, of examples like sprained ankles, edema, but I constantly pigeonhole them to digestion, but they've got far wider ranging applications. You're not the only one who pigeonholes them to <laughs> digestion. I think that's pretty common. Mm. Moving on from that, what about these other uses for proteolytic enzymes or indeed other parts of the enzyme spectrum, you know, the amylases, the lipases? Where else can we use them? Okay, well, since you've raised it, amylase, let's Let's go right back to the beginning. Amylase is, is typically for our carbohydrate di digestion. You've covered earlier cellulase is for cellulose. But we also have um, a couple of other main enzyme actions. Lactase digests lactose. Um, lipase digests our fats. And um, protease or proteolytic enzymes are typically for proteins. And they'll, um, they're essential for breaking proteins down from... Um, from you know protein from digestion or even endogen endogenously in the body into um, singular or smaller amino acids, which then might get reassembled for use elsewhere in the body. Yeah, so you know the most common sort of digestive complaint that we'd be thinking of would be you know the burping, bloating, even burning, the reflux conditions, but. You move on from there about pancreatic insufficiency. What interests me here is the signaling between the two organs, you know, in the digestive processes. But there's so much more what we can use the proteolytic enzymes for. So do you concentrate on the digestive aspect first or do you just go for these various other uses no matter what's happening with their digestion? No, I must say I rarely use, personally, rarely need to use enzymes for um, a, in a digestive capacity. I tend to try as much as I can to do that side of it with dietary interventions. And you know I love my fermented stuff, my apple cider vinegar, the raw foods that we crunch up and using our teeth and, and that kind of thing. So realistically, if I'm applying the use of enzymes, I'm using it 
in a in a capacity that is outside of digestion typically. So um, probably the most common thing I would apply proteolytic enzymes for is for um, injury, pain, and inflammation. Right. They are outstanding. Proteolytic enzymes are outstanding performers in this in this space. Um, you know, I, I think we can talk about your personal experience <laughs> with it falling down the stairs. <laughs> um, and I don't think that you had as much, uh, shall we call it, faith in enzymes when I was like, no, you need to take your you know, proteolytic anti-inflammatory enzymes right now oh. and do it constantly throughout the day to keep the swelling down. And when you got home and sort of thought, I got oh, cocky. I'll swap that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and how quickly your um, ankle blew up into a balloon. Um, <laughs> it, was a, so, it was a salient uh, lesson in arrogance. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, um, for, for our listeners, just to recap, what, what happened was I was actually at a seminar and I went to get something out of the car in this lovely, luxurious hotel and had this grand staircase. Descending the grand staircase, I decided to take the last five or six steps in one bound. Bang, just slipped. But the interesting thing was I, I had some digestive enzymes there. I had some bromelain and I took a lot of them during the seminar. Like I was in pain. But the interesting thing was that the next morning I could walk through, I could weight bear, it was tender, but I could weight bear on that joint and walk through my ankle, not limp mm. and put it out to the side like you normally do. And that really, that really amazed me. Indeed, at first I thought I was being a little bit of a, a, a sissy. And so I went, ah, oh, you didn't do any damage. It's fine. So I stopped taking the enzymes. Wow. <laughs> And so, yeah, yep. it blew up like a balloon, Front, uh, both sides bruising, ankle up like an absolute softball, about a softball size, mm. and mm. incredible pain, yeah. It was a big lesson. That just goes to show, doesn't it, the, um, the kind of almost multifaceted way that that was working upon your injury. Yeah. You know, this is what I love about enzymes is that not only are they strongly anti-inflammatory, working along pathways that, you know, some of our strongest um, pain-relieving drugs work on, such as, you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories to keep inflammation down and reduce the formation of, um, you know, blood clotting. And that's an important attribute in, yes. in injury healing because you it, it's like a highway. Yeah. There's, there's trucks coming and going from there to bring in healing, supplies of healing nutrients to bring in, you know, all sorts of things that are going to initiate the healing response. And it's part of why we get red and inflamed is because that helps induce, um, you know, circulation to the area. But when it gets when it gets to be too much, then that impedes the process and slows down the healing. So by taking enzymes at, at the very onset of an injury, you can you can speed up the healing considerably. And that's been shown time again in studies. That's an important point you make, though, Beck, in, in that we're not talking about blocking the natural production and resolution of a wound. Indeed, it's assisting in the resolution of that wound. It's not stopping it from happening. So this is one of the um, issues with, you know, NSAIDs and the the inhibition of COX, particularly COX-2. You know, we've seen these inhibitors and they were great because they don't give you stomach ulcers, but guess what? They produce increased uh, thromboxanes and give you heart attacks. There are class actions still ongoing with that class of drugs in Australia. And this is not the case with these proteolytic enzymes. Yes, they reduce cyclooxygenase too. But the other thing that your enzymes will work on as well from a, a pain perspective is um, there's, there's sort of two main substances that produce pain in the body. One is substance P mm. and the other is bradykinin. And so the great thing with proteolytic enzymes is not only are they working in a similar way but more a more a supportive way than an NSAID, but they're also working by a similar mechanism as, say, some of our um, analgesics, like even paracetamol, its mechanism is through substance P and yeah. shutting down that response to pain. So what we're getting is an anti-inflammatory and inducement of healing a reduction in, you know, um, problems arising from an, infl- an injury or inflammation and a reduction in pain. And you can get that from any injury, a broken bone, a sprain, a strain, a sore tooth, 
Um, even the pain, and, and this is also um, reflected in the evidence, but the, the pain and the swelling with something like sinusitis because it's still tissue inflammation. Okay, so let's talk about some of these uses. Um, do you want to start with sinusitis? Because uh, there was a really interesting trial, small, yes, but very, very applicable. Yes. Are you referring to one in children? Yep. That was the, the one. Antibiotic therapy? Yep. Yeah. Um, what I liked about that study is a lot of the things that you read um, about bromelain is it says that no safety is being uh, determined in children. Well, that particular study, it's 2005, um, but it showed some really great results. Um, so that what they were using, I think they had a, a, a group with just uh, monotherapy, as in just the only intervention was bromelain. Mm. Then a, a group with um, intervention of bromelain and, and other therapies, ancillary therapies, and then just standard intervention on um, acute sinus, sinusitis. And this is across a range of general practices in Germany. Yep. So um, what was interesting in the outcome was it was the monotherapy group that ended up with, A, less secondary infections, and also that they showed a, a statistically significant faster recovery time with their symptoms than the other intervention groups. So we can see that even when it's combined, it's still just as effective, if not possibly superior in, a, in, in its application for that. And I think, um, you know, we could glean from what we've read on bromelain that it's because of its multiple mechanisms of action. You're getting a reduction in inflammation. You're getting a thinning out of the mucus. You're getting um, an ability, therefore, for the body to enact upon whatever the invading virus is because you're keeping things flowing, keeping things moving. You're um, allowing um, a, a lot of things in the body to keep happening that are essential to immunity. Yeah. And then keeping inflammation down, therefore reducing the pain and the discomfort that we get from sinusitis. So... I really did like that study. Mm, mm. <laughs> I think one of the things that I always play on, if you like, or, or think about is just how safe bromelains are. You know, when you consider that I think Echinacea has uh, 2,000 milligrams per kilogram LD50, and that's the measure of lethal dose in 50% of rats or mice, bromelain is 10,000 milligrams per kilogram in mice. Mind you, if you're going to use it in that dose, your tongue would probably start falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, look, the interesting thing that I note is just how quickly these things work. And, I, like, I really was amazed with that ankle episode just how well it worked to the point where I thought I was being a sissy and I didn't actually do any damage and bang, as soon as I stopped taking it. And I was taking massive doses. You know how quickly when you eat fresh pineapple that you've cut up, not the stuff from the tin, yeah. but when you eat a fresh pineapple and it's cut up, you immediately feel the tingling sensation on your tongue. And that is those enzymes getting to work right away. And people always look at me like I have five heads when, you know, kids around me are sick and I'm like, go and get a fresh pineapple and eat it as much as you can or make it into juice. Okay, so we've spoken about, you know, the, the sprained ankle, that edema. For me, that leads into one of its way underutilised medical uses, which I believe medicos should be thinking of this, and that is post-surgery wound healing, or indeed, even in the flavour of the, the day now, what about um, cosmetic surgery? Absolutely. It's got so much potential um, in, a, in, a, in a, the space of surgery. Um, I was just having a bit of a, a read on uh, some of the ways perhaps that it's been looked at medically, and because I know I would use it pre pre and post surgically for any for anything just because I know that it, it helps with healing. And I, I personally for you know having to have an emergency cesarean, I most definitely was using um, bromelain, uh, like a bromelain proteolytic enzyme formula in lieu of painkillers because I think we have enough postnatal depression and baby blues without adding to it the burden of how down we can feel as mothers with some of those analgesic interventions. So, you know, I think yep. that if we can use if we can use something that's natural and, and improves healing and, you know, isn't going to have an impact on mood and attentiveness to baby, then brilliant. Um, and I was interested to find that it is reflected in the literature, literature that you, it, it can be used for women who've had an episiotomy as well um, ah. and to reduce sort of that swelling and bruising in, in women. So, you know, these things are obviously 
starting to get a bit of um, a bit of sort of spotlight in surgical areas. And I think I remember I don't remember the the study design, but it's old from you know reading about it. But that if you're a, an athlete, you can take your um, enzymes as a prophylactic. To you know, make sure that if you did sustain an injury, that you know you've got the best resources or capacity at your at in, internally to heal from that wound really quickly. So you don't you don't have to wait until you're injured. If you're in a sport or a type of um, a job where you know injuries and that kind of thing are quite common, yep. it wouldn't hurt to kind of take it prophylactically as a, as an option. And like you said, super safe. Um, so that those are some other things. I also was reading about how. It, got some potential for the debridement of wounds when you topically. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that that's some kind of pharmaceutical grade. I think it said about 35% bromelain in a, in a lipid base when yeah. I read the study. But um, I, like fascinating. How yeah. great is that? Imagine healing some, you know, horrible burns and things, healing them better. Exactly. Indeed. You know, what I'd love to see, and I, I, I've got to say, I haven't looked at that research, but it would be really interesting to see if it had a, an action on reducing scar tissue in severe burns. It just well might. I feel like it did say something along those lines, mm. and I will send it to you so you have it. <laughs> well, let's put it up on the FX Medicine website, yeah? Sure. Um, I remember just recently reading a smaller trial, but very interesting, uh, on delayed onset muscle soreness in athletes, so DOMS. And yep. what, what struck me was that it wasn't a hugely massive dose in this. It, it actually had quite a good effect at a reasonably low dose. Yeah, but like I said, if you're an, if you're an athlete, you're looking for anything that's going to help with your performance and, rec- and in particular performance is dictated by how quickly you recover from the intense sessions that you are undergoing through your training. So that makes sense to me in terms of an intervention. Yeah, I think what's needed now, and this is the ongoing issue that, you know, complementary therapies have is that, you know, they're often lambasted by the naysayers saying there's not enough good evidence. Well, great, let's do some more good evidence, but don't shut it down. Mm. Look at it because this stuff in, has merit. Indeed, I was looking at a review where it was looking at tendinopathies saying you know, further research is warranted. This stuff has merit. Um, so yeah. we really need to be looking further into it. Where I'm going with this is, you know, you think about the money and we're talking millions um, of dollars that are spent with, say, footy players, um, you know, netball, cricket. Um, there's so many other sports, cycling, where tendinopathies and other sports injuries occur where if you could find a nice cheap intervention that would prevent treat or reduce the issues with these um, pathologies of their muscles, their tendons, inflammation, then you can get these athletes back on the paid um, roster, if you like, for what they're um, paid to perform with. Yep. Again, comes right back to to how quickly they can recover, how resilient they are to injury. And, um, yeah, bromelain certainly shows a lot of merit in that sphere. So I've got to say, you've exposed my little thing about my ankle. I know that you play hockey. (laughs) Have you actually had any instances where you've used it? Oh, for sure. Um, So I have broken my ankle and and also (laughs) my husband seems to break things often. (laughs) Often. And I think (laughs) often. So um, I think it... Uh, I run around, obviously I'm not using it in isolation, but, you know, when I combine what I would combine for a broken bone or a sprain or a strain, which is usually proteolytic enzymes, perhaps some mineral formulation that's got some magnesium, calcium, and we're looking at employing like MSM and glucosamine and things like that as in a whole healing complex of nutrients, yeah. um, then I know for a fact I can reduce the the expected medical healing time in down to about you know three quarters easily, but sometimes by half. So where I was told it was going to take you know, six to eight weeks minimum for my ankle injury to heal, it would heal in sort of four to five, three to four weeks instead. So I mean that's that's pretty great, um, and obviously that's going to depend on somebody's level of health first. But it, it's not uncommon to. Um, be able to shorten the duration and speed up that healing time. Now, you've also, and this is another area which I constantly forget about and you constantly remind me about, the use of proteolytic enzymes with viral infections. Yes. So, um, 
we know we can't employ antibiotics that are chronically ineffective for a viral infection. But the interesting thing with um, proteolytic enzymes and bromelain is that they seem to, again, through their multitude of actions, um, A, thinning out mucus if there's, you know, uh, a cough or sinus or, or what have you. And in fact, bromelain itself has been shown to be very effective as a um, cough syrup alternative, just as an aside. But also, I mean, and I know that, that this doesn't specifically talk about, you know, individual uh, viral infections, but some evidence is suggesting even that bromelain can counteract the effects of an int- of intestinal pathogen. So things that give us like the tummy bugs or the barley belly or the runs or food poisoning such as E. coli, um, and they cause that diarrhea. So in a, in a similar mechanism, the idea is that bromelain helps with an anti-adhesion effect or therefore making it less likely for those pathogens to invade. And that's where I think it becomes a, an important application. Okay, so just to move on, because we are running out of time here, um, some appropriate dosages. And what I'd like to also cover are what about safety issues or cautions that we need to be aware of? Like, for instance, cystic fibrosis from nursing. You know, my memory of the use of proteolytic enzymes was cystic fibrosis and, uh, you know, things like biliary obstruction and pancreatic surgery, chronic pancreatitis, things like that. Can we go through some doses first? And then can we cover some safety issues? So, I mean, as we've kind of indicated before, there's a, a, a pretty massive window of safety on bromelain in terms of dosages. If you're talking 10 grams per kilo, you've got a pretty large window that you can um, prescribe that mm, in. Indeed. However, in saying that, um, you know, like a lot of things, I find using it in divided doses tends to be better. So anywhere from... 1,000 milligrams to 3,000 milligrams, usually in divided doses every few hours is, is what I find most effective. Um, and one important thing that we probably haven't covered off um, is also if we're going to be using enzymes in this capacity, as in using them for their mucolytic or anti-inflammatory type um, application, then we must definitely be using them outside of eating food. So that means at least half an hour before food or two hours after food, because if we use them inside that window, they're going to act, you know, as a digestive substrate instead of, you know, in the manner that we wish to employ them otherwise. So it has good time first thing in the morning and before we go to bed. Sometimes I will, I will low dose at those times just because you've got, you know, this really long period of time where they can act. And then uh, just because you've, you've raised it, um, the cystic fibrosis and into the safety side of things. This is certainly not an alternative to the medical therapy of proteolytic enzymes in cystic fibrosis. Yeah. It may have some merit as an adjunctive therapy, but certainly not an alternative. That's right. And, and I think our listeners need to realise it, it may not be indeed the proteolytic enzymes that is the difference with regards to what we can uh, access over the counter, but indeed the lipase, pancreatic lipase, um, which, I mean, I'm going to name the drug because it's a prescribed thing. It's Creon Fort, and it's a stabilised uh, product that's in these micro capsules that's available mm. on prescription for cystic fibrosis and, you know, um, the biliary issues, um, pancreatic issues, forgive me. But that's not to say it's not got some merit in, you know, assisting with, you know, the mucus reduction right. or, you know, improving the the airways and, and just the fluidity of that through the body. So, um, and also resistance to infection as well. I'm sure a lot of people would Absolutely. be um, using that in that way, you know, in cystic fibrosis patients. Some of the interesting things are when you look at the safety of bromelain, though, you know, one caution is that it can potentiate antibiotics. So, you know, one of those things, is that a good or a bad thing? If you ha- if you were able to potentiate an antibiotic, make it work more effectively, That's right. could you use less? I mean, this is some of these things about antibiotic resistance. This, this kind of stuff needs to be looked at in greater detail. And, of course, I mean, it goes without saying, it's going to have an, it's having an action on inflammation and fibrogen formation. So, you know, there's a cautionary warning there with, anticoagulants. I mean, warfarin, you can't take anything with warfarin and some of those other things. Um, So we probably wouldn't uh, use it in patient groups that are using those. And 
The other cautionary area for it as well is that it seems to be able to have some kind of um, potentiating effect on sedatives. So anything from oh. your um, pain-killing benzodiazepines to um, some antidepressants like tricyclic antidepressants or even alcohol. Um, so, and I don't know what the mechanism is behind that, but the caution also extends to herbal sedatives as well. So it may make valerian kava, et cetera, more potent as well. That's, a, that's actually a really interesting use rather than a caution, certainly, but even perhaps a therapeutic use to make them more effective in maybe in some resistant mm. patients. Uh, we will be putting a couple of papers up on the therapeutic potential Uh, clinical potential therapeutic applications. There's a few great reviews from like Biomedical Reports 2016 and there was um, Biotechnology Research. So we'll put those up on the FX Medicine website for our listeners to access there and they can go through these actions and certainly the cautions and precautions. Mm, And hopefully use proteolytic enzymes outside (laughs) of digestion. You're telling me again, aren't you? (laughs) Yeah, injury, trauma, headaches, migraines, you know, surgery, coughs, colds, resistance to infection. I mean, the the list goes on and on. Brilliant stuff. I love your therapeutic application and I love the way that you wake me up by shaking me around the neck and going, wake up. So thank you for taking us through these clinical applications, the practical applications of proteolytic enzymes today, Beck. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. The FX Medicine team would like to thank the enormous generosity of all our guests who have graciously donated their time, their expertise, and their stories of both triumph and adversity. Most of all, we'd like to thank you, our listeners, for your continued feedback and support and for giving us direction and purpose as we move forward together into the future. 